But we're going to be talking now about how this has disproportionately affected people of color. And we've mentioned it many times, but a new report reveals just how much. The coronavirus mortality rate for black Americans is almost two and a half times higher than the rate for whites. And our next guest, Dr. Helene Gale, explains why. She's the former director of the CDC's National Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention, and she now leads the Chicago Community Trust. And here she's speaking to our Michelle Martin about the social determinants of this issue. Thanks, Christian. Dr. Gale, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. You know, I hate to start with this, but as um, you had 20 years at the Centers for Disease Control, you've worked on infectious diseases control and prevention around the world. So I'm guessing that you were aware of this pandemic perhaps a little earlier or what the possible implications could be earlier than a lot of people were. Um, as we are speaking now, some 92,000 deaths just in the United States alone, some 1.5 million infections. Did you see this coming, this magnitude? All of us who have been focused on these issues knew that something like this was possible. Um, I don't think any of us really predicted how fast and how furious um, this particular pandemic would unfold. But I think we definitely could have seen the signs much earlier, and as we started to see it um, really unfolding around the world, I think it should have been um, a warning to us to really quickly act and act much more quickly than we did at a time when the infections were not as prevalent in the community. You know, so the timing of when you put actions in place is particularly important. Um, doing it early does have a huge impact on how you stem the tide. And I think we could have, and there's so many people who have said, um, you know, it was SARS yesterday, Ebola the day before. It is only a matter of time when another infectious disease comes and sweeps through our population. We should have been ready. We should have acted earlier. And now we're seeing the consequences. Recognizing that it's always hard for us to criticize our colleagues. I mean, what about the Centers for Disease Control's role in all this? I mean, even members of the administration have criticized that agency for the early tests, for example. First of all, creating a bottleneck with the tests. Secondly, the tests were ineffective or you know, flawed in, in a number of ways. What, what do you have to say about the performance of your former agency? You know, the fact that there were some flaws in the original test, um, people were moving fast. But that does not mean that this agency did not have the capacity, if given the right tools, given the right resources, and given um, the ability to do, its, to do its task, that it could not have done more uh, more rapidly. You're saying you don't think this is a matter of incompetence at the CDC. You think this is a matter of what? Underfunding or what? What do you think it is? Because there are those who just say this is a reflection of competence at the, the leadership of that agency. Well, you know, I, I, you know, I think um, it, it's hard uh, from outside to be able to make a, a, an accurate uh, diagnosis of what the challenges are. I know that when our federal system works well, when it's coordinated, when we have leadership, um, at the top and when the departments are well coordinated and the agencies within the department have what they need, we're able to, to deliver. And I think we weren't able to deliver because we didn't have all of those pieces in place. You know, the government works best when it's well coordinated, when it has the resources that it needs, and when the mandates of agencies are allowed to um, operate and do what they do best. So I think there's a lot of ways in which we should look at this and figure out what were the stumbling blocks? Where did we not um, provide the kind of support? Where was the coordination not what it should have been? And at the top, was there the kind of uh, focus that this was something serious so that you know all hands were on deck and everybody was working to the best of their capacity? So let's wheel around to the subject of how this disease is affecting different communities differently. I know that a lot of people like to say, oh, you know, we're all in this together and that the, vi the virus doesn't care if you're, you know, rich or poor or who you are. It kind of seems like that's not true. But how do you understand the racial differences? I mean, in Chicago alone, as you know, as I understand it, city is, what, 30% African-American, but African-Americans are like 70% of the deaths. 
And as I understand it from the latest figures here, for example, the death rate for African Americans is higher than for any other group in the country. The COVID-19 mortality rate for Black Americans is 2.4 times as high as the rate for whites. It's 2.2 times as high as the rate for Asians and Latinos. How do you understand that? The death rate, particularly the higher death rate in, in African Americans, is probably explained by the fact that um, African Americans also have a disproportionate impact of diseases that pre predispose one to a worse outcome if they get the infection. Uh, so diabetes, uh, hypertension, other um, lung diseases, et cetera, uh, means that if you get this, you may be more likely to have serious complications and death. But those very diseases are not just about um, health factors. They're also about the social and economic factors that expose people to poor health to begin with. So for instance, here in Chicago, there is a 30-year life expectancy gap within a five-mile um, distance from an African-American uh, neighborhood compared to a downtown primarily white neighborhood. And so those as we call them, social determinants of health, um, impact who lives, who dies, how long one lives, et cetera. So there's that factor. But, you know, I think the other thing that we have to continually remind ourselves that while this is a public health issue, the gravest consequences are economic. And because we have had this um, stay-at-home shutdown that has also shut down our economy, those who were also most uh, economically uh, in vulnerable positions are also seeing the worst of this in terms of the economic consequences. And remember that you know, when we talk about essential workers having to continue to work, we're often talking about black and brown people who are in our grocery stores, who are our caretakers, uh, who are in factories, et cetera, who are putting themselves at risk every day because they've got to make tough choices about whether or not I continue to be able to have a job to put food on my family's plate, or do I stay at home because I'm concerned that my job puts me at risk for this infection? Again, added to that, if I live in a multi-generational home or a small apartment with multiple members of my family, how do you social distance? and if those family members are also going to jobs that put them at risk. So this is just um, factor upon factor that is making, I think in many ways, unmasking some of the social inequities that existed um, before COVID and are even deeper now post COVID. You keep, you keep moving us our conversation toward that inequality question, so I'd like to talk more about that if you would. And one of the reasons that we called you is that you know, after a very long career in the public health space, in, in the infectious disease space, you've been focusing on sort of inequality, inequality. Why is that your, your focus of your work more broadly? And why is it so relevant here? Well, as a public health professional, um, you know, my goal and goal of public health professionals, I guess, is, is to really look at health and health equity to make sure that all people have the opportunity to live a healthy life. And if you pierce below what is we consider to be part of the medical and public health toolkits, we recognize that so much of the disparities that we see in health are not determined by access to health and health services. Um, that um, probably amounts to somewhere between 20 to maybe 40% of what determines health disparities, but the rest of it really is more determined by things that we call the social determinants of health. Access to a living wage income, um, education, public safety, access to nutritious food, all of these things have a greater impact on health outcomes than what we can do by getting access to health care. And if you really want to make a difference in the health of, of people and populations and nations, then you've got to look at these uh, underlying root cause, or as we call them, social determinants of health. So I think it, for me, it was a natural progression from you know, looking at what I could do in the health toolkit to looking what I could do in the societal um, drivers of poor health. So Dr. Gale, did you have a eureka moment? 
where you said to yourself, you know, I've been working on health and getting people, you know, people trying to keep people from getting sick and trying to help sick people get well. But really what I need to be doing is focusing on these immense wealth gaps. I worked for over 20 years on HIV and AIDS, and both in this country as well as globally. Um, I think particularly globally, it plays out so clearly that you know, the, it is the inequities, it is the lack of uh, social status, it is the lack of ability to control one's life that really does influence who's at risk and who's not at risk. You know, we saw the same thing here as uh, HIV continued to impact uh, communities of color more. So I think as I um, continued to work in my career, uh, I gradually just migrated to where I thought I could have the greatest impact. What would a response that took into account the racial and ethnic wealth gap look like? As an organization, um, my organization, the Chicago Community Trust, which is Chicago's main community foundation, we've made as our highest priority closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap for all the reasons that I said that I think that it is so core and fundamental. And we've looked at that um, and thought about three ways in which we can impact. First, um, what do we do to increase wealth and assets at the household level, uh, increasing jobs, increasing people's ability to own, own homes and, and develop assets through home ownership, um, building small businesses. We know that small businesses are a huge driver of jobs in this country. In fact, the major driver of jobs in this country and economic um, vitality, particularly in communities of color. So we also wanna look at how do you make sure that you can reduce the debt and debt burden that often saddles um, families even if they have um, growing incomes and some uh, ability to accumulate wealth. You know, we also want to look at what can we do at the neighborhood level. You know, if you look at Chicago, like so many other, so many other cities, um, there's great disparities in terms of the investment in different neighborhoods. So we wanna really look at how can we help drive investment in some of the, uh, the historically underinvested neighborhoods so that economic vitality can flourish. And we know when, when you start having businesses, when you start having development, um, you know, streets are safer, uh, people wanna move back into some of these neighborhoods. So can we make some of these neighborhoods who have been historically underinvested vibrant again by uh, helping to catalyze investment in those neighborhoods? And then finally, at the community level, how do we engage citizens so that they can take the kind of actions and be at the table so when decisions are made about their lives and lives of their neighbors, they're empowered um, and they are able to actually um, drive the change that happens in their own neighborhoods. How does this argument sell? I mean, traditionally, this country has been very reluctant to uh, participate in kind of income leveling mechanisms, right? I mean, there was a huge fight over Social Security, but eventually we've accepted it as something that gives dignity to the most vulnerable people, particularly seniors, you know, but also, say, kids who've lost a parent or people who are profoundly disabled. But we are very reluctant in this country to kind of argue that everybody kind of deserves some sort of basic floor of income, particularly when they're younger. So how are you making this, how are you making this argument to people and how are they, how are they receiving it? You know, if I look at the situation here in Chicago, two thirds of the population is uh, are people of color, uh, African American or Latinx. Um, but two thirds of that of, of those uh, groups have um, less than two to three months worth of savings, um, so that if they're out of work for a month or two, they are plunged into poverty. We can't have two thirds of our population. Uh, teetering on the brink of poverty and expect that our economy will move forward. It's been demonstrated time and time again that if you just run the numbers, um, the ability for us to move forward as an economy when two-thirds of our uh, population is being held back doesn't bode well. Uh, we, we, help to, uh, we help to support uh, a, a report that came out a few years ago that demonstrated that the cost of segregation in Chicago was upwards of $4 billion. And that if we were able to um, decrease 
the segregation in the city and give opportunities more equally, it would add as much as $8 billion in GDP um, to the Chicago economy. So there's hard evidence of why, in fact, equity matters and why really tearing down some of the systemic barriers to um, equity actually is costing us more. And if we look at it as a nation, well, we know we are, we are moving to being a majority minority society soon. It is in all of our interest to make sure that people have the ability to realize their eco economic um, potential so that we can all move forward. And I think that some of the things that we have done as a result of this um, pandemic through uh, some of the congressional legislation have already given us a blueprint for some of the things that we could do in the future. So the fact that small businesses are getting access to loans that perhaps never had the opportunity to have the kind of flexible lending, the fact that there's uh, protection for part-time and gig workers, uh, the fact that we're actually giving cash to people to be able to support themselves through this crisis. Let's look at some of those things. Let's look at what it takes to have broadband access to everybody so that our, our young people are not losing months and months of education because, they, because of the di digital divide in our country. I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from what we're doing in this crisis moment that could help us to shift public policy longer term. Dr. Helene Gale, thank you so much for talking with us. My pleasure.